projected. What's up, everybody? This is Justin with Archangels Media, chilling here with Cornell. And, man, we are so excited to be bringing up our book, or not our book, uh, Andre Orlov's book, um, uh, The Glory of the Invisible God. Man, we have been... Uh, we weren't the really ghost writers. Yeah, we yeah we didn't write it. Yeah, Andre didn't take any notes from us. You know, let's just put it in. <laughs> um, but this book was recommended, and this author was recommended to us by uh, Father Stephen DeYoung himself. The last time he was here, and so we are very excited. Now we've also done something a little bit differently as well. We have. Um, We've made a real presentation, so we really hope that you enjoy it. Please give us feedback. Feedback is so important to us. Um, so that being said, Cornell, give us your, your your first thoughts. You know, just general thoughts about what we what, what we've been reading. General thought: Who knew that a dense, academic, dry piece of scholarly work? could be so theologically interesting, explosive, and um, I don't want to oversell it, but practical in a way like, that I, yeah. that mm -hmm. I didn't think about. Like it's interesting and to think about in these realms. A lot of times when you're talking about this sort of stuff, it's really heady and it's mm -hmm. super detached from reality. Mm -hmm. And um you know, okay, why are you guys having these conversations? You're just talking about unicorns and zombies, um, you know? And um, I, I would say that there's more here than that what meets the eye. Uh, my good friend Cynthia is in the, in the chat. She says she likes eggs. God bless you, Cynthia. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, like Kelsey's Kelsey should be popping in here pretty soon. These are people that I grew up with people I went to church with, um, as a child. Um, and, uh, I'm very excited, uh, that they're here. Kay's ah, great. Awesome. Kelsey's here as well. So we're going to be discussing a whole lot of really neat Jewish literature. Uh, my friend Kelsey is all about, um, uh, intertestamental apocryphal Jewish literature. She's very excited about uh, some of these texts. So uh, I'm glad that she's joining with us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my Cynthia is still uh, a oneness heretic and apparently proud about it. Well, well, <laughs> so uh, God bless you. Okay. You can so join let's get the second temple period. Well, that. you're gonna, you're, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna really enjoy this. I really think that you're gonna enjoy this. Yeah. So, um, let's let's get rolling here. Cool. So, first of all, the name of the book that we're reading is "The Glory of the Invisible God: Two Powers in Heaven Traditions and Early Christology" by a man named Andre Orlov. Um, and this is his book. The I wonderful book, terrible cover. If, if there's a, if there is a, if, if there's truth to the saying, don't judge a book by its cover, it is this book, <laughs> right? Uh, but this is the author here, Andre Orlov, and he does not have any YouTube presence. So hopefully um, well, he doesn't seem to be interested. He, this, this man is a scholar's scholar. You know, he writes academic material so that other academics can write their own academic material. Okay. These guys are, uh, th this is, as, is an elite scholar um, in uh, specifically Slavonic uh, pseudepigrapha. Uh, he teaches at Marquette and uh, is just truly, you know, an amazing writer, amazing um, uh, guy. So, well, I, you know, I hope he's an amazing guy. I assume he is. So, <clears throat> Uh, first thing, we've got some yellow tape here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this yellow tape, Cornell? Yellow tape. Um, basically, what we have coming before us is a lot of Jewish speculation and revelatory experiences that I would describe as throwing darts. You kind of know the direction of the dartboard, but the lights are off, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. so they're trying to figure things out. Um, but nonetheless, there is a milieu of conceptual framework and a worldview that these Jews definitely had. And that isn't all of a sudden going to change all at once in, you know, 
whatever few years it is when Jesus arrives, right? Because this literature, mm -hmm. most of it's written within a couple hundred years, sometimes even earlier than the time of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so really the, the first source we're going to be looking at is going to be the very end of the Old Testament canon uh, in the book of Daniel. And then we'll, we'll see kind of how um, some of these um, very important Jewish sources and things that we can even see in the New Testament that have allusions to these sources even, which is important. Um, mm -hmm. You can tell that they are interested in these things as well. Or direct and quotations sometimes. Direct so. quotations, allusions, um, it's there. Uh, it's hard mm -hmm. to deny that, which is really cool to see um, some of the wordings that are used in the New Testament. You say, wait, I saw that in Luke chapter 1. Oh, I mm -hmm. saw that here. And so they're mm -hmm. definitely interacting with this material, which is um, should encourage us to, I think, in a way. Like, okay, well, well if they were engaging with this stuff, even if they didn't think it was canon, doesn't mean they thought it was bad. Right. Right. The Bible was not written in a vacuum. Right. It's not like, oh, there is the Bible and then there's nothing that influenced the biblical writers. No, you know what I mean? Like right. this, the, the, reading this material will inform and uh, enrich your experience of reading scripture. I think there's no doubt in that. Right. And so what we want to do is, is one, first express with the yellow tape. Not all not all ideas here are what we consider orthodox it's not the end story here right mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff is more shadows and types and um they're thinking about this idea of a second power which we're going to get into mm -hmm. and what we want to show further is that the the jewish people only much later like fifth century started to really um get rid of this these ideas because they were very supportive of uh, the Judeo-Christian framework, really what we see mm -hmm. in um, the first century, second century. I mean, you, you see this stuff chock full all the way through the fathers, which will we'll show some good quotes from the fathers as well that mm -hmm. show um, a connection between the early church fathers, second temple period, and how that wraps around the New Testament. These are all, there's a good continuity here. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, um, there are some ideas here that I think we would term Aryan or adoptionist. Right. Okay? Yeah. Um, and this, these are things that we definitely, um, don't support. Right. Exactly. Um, it's I, one of the things I just want to point out here is that really, um, while there is certainly continuation between these ideas and later Christian heresies of adoptionism, right? Adoptionism, the idea that Jesus kind of became the son of God at his baptism or became the son of God at his resurrection. He wasn't always the son of God or it wasn't always uh, divine, right? He was a human and then became divine later. Um, there is certainly continuity with that thought process uh, in these texts, but there is not continuity with that thought process and the apostles. Okay. The New Testament. The New Testament has a very, um, uh, there's, there's, there's connecting tissue, but there is, this is a different concept entirely. And it is more importantly, uh, it's more important to have continuity with the apostles than it is to have continuity with Jewish speculation um, on the identity of, of the second power. Okay. Um, now, also, you're going to see this uh, this referred to in the text as uh, the two powers heresy. Okay. Now, that phrase, two powers heresy, is a later rabbinic condemnation of these thoughts. Okay. But during the time, these were orthodox. <laughs> Mainstream ideas. Mainstream. Everybody held this, right? Um, normal, plain Jane, Jewish monotheism. Okay. Michael, God bless you. It's great to see you in the chat. God bless you. Um, so, so the, go ahead. And, and the other thing is that there are other, apart from the two powers theory, right. Or the two powers her heresy, other Christian beliefs were also ejected from Judaism, uh, such as the rebellion of Satan and the fall of the angels. And we're also going to discuss uh, those concepts as well, because this is directly attached, right? Uh, this is really a uh, joint. So go ahead, brother. 
No, I'm just a little excited. What I was going to say, I think, is the next slide. So Great. All right. So, so uh, what are the two powers? Okay, so this is a Byzantine icon uh, depicting, depicting um, the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Okay. Um, so we have the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man and Surrounded and the, the Holy Ghost is there. And so mm -hmm. this is, you know, what's going on there. So go ahead. Why don't you, why don't you lay down some important terminology for us? Right. So this is just kind of groundwork to understand this whole what is the two powers thing like what does that even mean and what we're saying is that there are dual theophanies there's two theophanies one theophany is taking place orally the other one is taking place visually so this idea of god revealing himself in a sensible form right mm -hmm. so whether you're seeing god or hearing god is theophonic right mm -hmm. and so one of the things we see um in this literature is a progression of how these powers or these attributes of the first power, right? He has a scepter, he has a rod, he's on a throne. Um, these are sorts of things that only belong to Yahweh, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you see those properties being transferred upon this second power. And it's like, wait a minute, I thought that was God. This is God? And so that's the idea that's coming to mind here, right? This transferal of um, divine um, functionality and um, attributes. authority, attributes, all these sorts of things are imagery, being... motif. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is thematic, and it's and we see this chock full of several um, two power type figures that are being transferred. This stuff, right? And so mm -hmm. one is what. Um, Andre Orlov terms as anaconic. The other one is iconic. One you can't see, one you do see, right? Mm -hmm. That's really important um, to, to recognize that um, distinction here. Okay. And I think it's also important to know, you know, as you mentioned, there's a progress. So, you know, the oldest forms of the two powers, you do see, right? Both powers. You, you, you do, right? But as the tradition moves on, eventually that second power is basically the booming voice from heaven, right? Um, and, he, and you can't see him, right? The invisible God, right? That's the idea. And uh, so that's that's the kind of the historical trajectory um, of what he's discussing, right? So again, we have this oral element, this auditory thing. And then you have these visual elements, and we'll, we'll discuss more about that, right? Um, so this here is Alan Siegel. Alan Siegel is a Jewish scholar, okay? And um, so he wrote this um, amazing book um, called The Two Powers in Heaven. Uh, we'll show you that book in a second. But this is uh, the guy really who, I, I guess, kicked the door down on some of this and, and kind of saying, hey, you know what? Christianity and Judaism, the worldview, if you go back far enough, is is identical, <laughs> okay, or or very similar, not identical, but very similar, right? Um, so th this right here, this is what he says: reflecting on the essence of the rabbinic debates about two powers or authorities, Siegel proposed that the basic heresy involved interpreting scripture to say that a principal angelic or hypostatic manifestation in heaven was equivalent to God. OK, so this is important. Rabbinic. There are rabbinic. Right. Uh, Later. The, right. Yeah, exactly. They're calling it a heresy. But basically, it's this idea that there are two divine beings. OK, that's what the two powers heresy is called. But again, we're, we're going to keep going. So uh, the following books uh, discuss this in detail and short. Um the, the point is that there were ways in which Jews were able to have two divine persons, one of whom is a human being, without violating monotheism, as this was the majority view during the second period, uh, temple period, before and after Christianity. So and let me just note there the reason why it's Benetarian mm -hmm. and not modalism mm -hmm. is simply because there is a distinctive element. And there's a relational element between the two figures. Right. It, it isn't just a, a mode. Right. Um, even if it is a mode, like in the in the in the technical sense of mode, yes, mm -hmm. I have a mode, 
you have a mode um, and we're separate modes. We we're both share the same nature, um, mm -hmm. but there's a relational communal element between these two powers and you don't get that in, in modalism. You, you don't right. get a communal aspect of persons. Okay. And right. you do have that here. Right. Absolutely. Um, and so, we're, so these are the couple. So this is Alan Siegel, the two powers in heaven, early rabbinic uh, reports about Christianity and Gnosticism. Some of these developed, some of these ideas do spin out into Gnosticism. We'll see that in a second. Um, the Great Angel, a study of Israel's second God by Mark Red Baker uh, that you can take a look at as well. Um, then you have Two Gods in Heaven, Jewish Concepts of God and Antiquity by uh, uh, Peter Schaefer. Uh, and then this is a book that just got published, and I'm not going to be able to read it because it's literally $90. Um, <laughs> but it's called Three Powers in Heaven, The Emergence of Theology and the Parting of the Ways, right? So there is... Um, uh, that's that's what this is, right? There's there's this is a, an explanation of why the Jews and the Christians end up splitting, um, and and this person is is talking about three powers, which is uh, you know obviously Christians would are more in line with that, um, and then we have the religion of the apostles by Father Stephen de Young. This is not as academic. Um, this is more. What do you call it? Um, this this will meet you where you're at. This is popular yeah, this, level. Uh, yeah, and that, that's level. what Stephen DeYoung wanted. Father Stephen mm -hmm. DeYoung wanted to reach a pretty wide audience. And I would when yeah. we did when we read the book. So if you guys are interested, you guys buy this book. You can actually go to our playlist and you can watch as we me and Justin read through this and commented on it. So right, yeah, and um, and, and that's really what Father Stephen DeYoung does really well is eating up these uh, eating up these big worms and then feeding us like baby birds. And <laughs> uh, and he's he's really good at that. Very pastoral. Um, so that being said, here's a here's a picture of a Larry Hurtado. We've got a, a quote here. Um, this is we only know this quote because it's in the Orlov book, right? Um, mm -hmm. If we seek to factor to account for the striking innovation constituted by the incorporation of Christ into a binitarian devotional pattern. That is, if we seek an answer to the question of why Christ devotion assumed the proportions it did and so quickly, I propose that we have to allow for the generative role of revel uh, revelatory religious experiences. Okay. So, in other words, uh, what he's saying is Christians already had a worldview whereby they could recognize Jesus as divine uh, and as a man who's divine and worship him without breaking Jewish monotheism. Okay. And that this is, um, this comes from an outgrowth of what is described as revelatory religious experience. What Larry Hurtado is saying is they saw Jesus be resurrected from the dead <laughs> <laughs> He's just not saying that in that words, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Retro Orthodox. He says Jews had a worldview. You mean yes, Jews had a worldview, and Christians adopted. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, it's not Christians even that, and Jews, right? Well, it's not is, even that Christians adopted it. The Christians were Jews. There was right, the no distinction between a Christian and a Jew. Right. Um, it was just Judaism continued who found their Messiah, and that's what right. we want to kind of present here. Exactly. So there were other, uh, yes, we'll, we'll get to that. So, yeah. um, but revelatory religious experiences, that means, you know, uh, experiences with the risen Jesus. That means rece receiving the gift of the Holy ghost, things like that, that led Christians, uh, to, uh, worship Jesus ultimately. Okay. Uh, this is Daniel, uh, Boyarin. This is another, uh, Jewish, uh, scholar. He says, there is significant evidence uncovered in large part by Siegel. So he's pointing back to Alan Siegel uh, that in the first century, many, perhaps most Jews held a binitary doctrine of God. OK, so again. Most Jews, though, so you can't take modern Judaism, throw it back 2000 years and expect it's the same. It's it's not. OK, go ahead. I was going to say there, there would be Judaisms, you know. Right. So we have we can we can point to several different um, Jewish sects within Jewish thought during the Second Temple period. But what he's saying here, it's mainstream thought. It is orthodox thought, if you will, <laughs> that this is how Jews thought about God. They were binitarian. 
Right. They they recognize this two powers language, and it's since later on that that was no longer the case. Right. Okay. Right. Exactly. Cool. So, um, <laughs> so Cornell got to go visit um, Father Stephen DeYoung, and uh, he brought him back to my place. Um, <laughs> and so uh, Jeff says here. Let me see here. The evil one must really wanted to bury the fact that in those times there was a belief in a Benetarian God. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you see, you know, Christians starting to shy away from things like the Trinity um, uh, during basically Islam, right? Not just not just Islam, but also the, you know, iconographic or not iconographic, icon, uh, iconoclastic. Yeah, iconoclastic heresies. Um which eventually led to um, uh, the rejection of Jesus as that. divine. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. So, um, all right, uh, let me see here. I love that picture, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. All right. In the period following the advent of Christianity and the destruction of the, of the Jerusalem temple in AD 70, followed by the destruction of Jerusalem itself at the end of the Bar Kokhba uh, rebellion, rabbinic Judaism was born. It was born, however, through a repudiation of Christianity and of Second Temple traditions that lent themselves to or resonated with Christianity. Nearly universal views, such as minimally a binitarian godhead, were reputed as heresy. The vast range of literature produced during the Second Temple period vanished from Judaism in a generation as a result of a ban on writing not lifted until centuries later as the Talmudic tractates were composed. The entire reading of the Hebrew scriptures was transformed, as was the ritual life of Judaism, in direct reaction and counterpoint to the parallel Christian structures. Rabbinic Judaism is a new religion that came into being in the 4th and 5th centuries A.D. Okay. So this is, you know, <laughs> I sent this to Jacob Federucci and he was not happy, um, <laughs> right? Because really, you know, when we look at it, who believes in the fall of the angels? Christians, right? Do Jews? No. Right? <laughs> who believes in hell? Christians. Do Jews? No. <laughs> um, who uh, practices temple worship? Christians? Yes. Jews? No. Right? So the um and you know who believes in a multipersonal you know uh divine power right christians jews no right so so judaism changed christianity didn't change judaism changed and i think that's i think that's important right i, I mean i would want to qualify that and say in, in some ways with the revelation of christ what we're going to show is they were able to take these shadowy type um figures in the second temple and and concrete those figures in the one casting the shadow, Jesus himself, who is the eternal son of God, um, right. which is kind of the, the whole point here is that these concepts and these melus were already pregnant with these ideas. And so this idea of Jesus coming and being the Messiah and be, being who he is, isn't um, incompatible. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. It's not. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. So, identifying the second power. Who's that second power? Okay. <laughs> Who is it? Who, who's that Pokemon, guys? Who's that Pokemon, guys? So, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, Retro Orthodoxy says, the fulfillment of the law. I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. Right? Yeah, uh, Jeff, I don't know what that face means, but maybe Ghost. he just thinks it's funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, Really, what we're what we're about to see is that there were many candidates uh, for the identity of the second power, and you're going to be amazed at the spectrum of the different people that Jews kind of put in that seat, right? Um, and it's important because really, what they're doing is they're looking at scripture, and there's these figures that are very obviously divine starting even in the book of Genesis, right? Um, where the angel of the Lord is called God uh, by Hagar. Uh, he's called God by, you know, the word of the God is, is called God by Abraham, right? Um, we see the angel of the Lord identifying himself as the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Exodus, right? 
so there's this figure that is um, humanish, right? Uh, has a form, uh, is able to eat food, things like this, and yet, um, who's this? Who's this? Who's this figure? Right? Who? Who is this ancient power? And then especially when you get to the two power stuff, it's interesting. Uh, Retro Orthodox throws out the word Metatron. Boom. We will get to um, that. We will get to Metatron, uh, not to be confused with Megatron. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, I was going to say, um, this idea, like what, what Heiser concludes here, is these speculations were not considered unorthodox. Um, yes. The idea is evil entered the world. And we need someone to eradicate that evil. Mm -hmm. And God is going to send someone from the seed of Eve to crush the head of Satan at some point and bring paradise back to mankind. And so they were looking because God said he's going to do this. Right. Wouldn't you? Um, right. And so it's not unorthodox for them to reflect on this and think about it. And I don't know if this take is right or not, but even the disciples were saying, you know, are, are you the one, you know, and some people thinking John the Baptist might be this messianic figure even. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of to me in the same vein of looking for this second power figure, who's going to eradicate the evils of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very good. So, uh, so the theories behind the identity of the second power have ranged from Moses to Enoch, later identified in uh, rabbinic literature as the Metatron, right? So, um, uh, retro orthodox threw up the name Metatron up here. Um, that's David, and Enoch uh, later becomes the Metatron, and we'll, we'll look at that as well uh, eventually. Um, then we actually have Satan himself as a second power, and we will discuss, and then also Adam. Uh, some of which we can we can cover now. We're going to go over that, and others which will be discussed uh, greater in future installments. Right. So stick around. This is going to be a very interesting uh, thing, and we're going to try to keep up the quality. So this is uh, William Blake, uh, William Blake's uh, Ancient of Days um, image. I like it. So, so the most explicit first depiction of these two powers, right? You do see in the Old Testament, the angels of the Lord identified as God, right? Um, you do see this word of the Lord figure appearing to Abraham. And we do see, you know, uh, statements from uh, God saying, no man can see my face and live. And you're like, well, like, why, you know, why is it that we have this other uh, angel out here calling himself God that people can see and they don't die. And then you've got this other figure that you know, or other statements where God says, No man can see my face and live, right? Um, and so we're going to kind of discuss that, but uh, ultimately, though, in Daniel chapter 7 is the first time that we see both of these figures at the same time in the same place, right? And that's important. So, Cornell, once you, uh, once you, I guess, maybe read this or whatever, I beheld until the thrones were set and the ancient of days sat, and his raiment was white as snow. And the hair of his head as pure wool. His throne was a flame of fire, and his wheels burning fire. A stream of fire rushed forth before him. Thousand thousands ministered to him, and ten thousands of myriads attended upon him. The judgment sat, and the books were opened. I beheld in the night vision, and lo, one coming with the clouds of heaven as the Son of Man. And he came unto the ancient of days, and was brought near to him. And to him was given the dominion, and the honor, and the kingdom, and all nations, tribes, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. Okay. So, we've got these two divine persons, right? We've got Ancient of Days sitting on a throne, right? Then we see him calling forward the Son of Man. The Son of Man comes riding in on the clouds, right? Um, I think you have a scripture reference here. Uh, we'll, we'll get to it, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's Psalms. in the Psalms. 103, yeah. 104. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll get there. So there, there's these imagery, right? As we talked about this, this idea of gradually over time, more and more attributes move from the first power to the second power, right? Um, and so uh from the from the first power to the second power. Ancient of days to the son of man. 
Right, exactly. And the first one seems to be that he's riding on a cloud. Right? That's the first one that seems to be. The other thing is that everybody um, worships him, right? Uh, to him was given the dominion, the honor, the kingdom, and all nations, tribes, and languages shall serve him, right? So I think that's, you know, great. Uh, said so says, congratulations, Justin. I don't know what you're congratulating me for, but God bless you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, but here we go. So notice there's a few things in the text. First, there's a processional order, okay? So first we see the Ancient of Days, and then we see the Son of Man. Right. And so what they're doing is they're kind of establishing hierarchy or rank or whatever it is that you might want to call that. But you see this like uh, procession first, the ancient of days, then the second power. And that's going to be a common motif uh, going forward. OK, um, and this is consistent with what is called the orthodox doctrine of the monarchy of the father. Right. So orthodoxy has a way of identifying the one God as the father and not just some divine nature or whatever that the Western um, church has taken on. Um, and if you want to learn more about the monarchy of the father, you can see this video by Dr. Bill Branson. We're going to show you the first 50 minutes of it. If you guys can't hear it, you please tell me in the comments. Okay. Would you save someone in the old Testament, whether it was a prophet or a character in the old Testament that saw God, that was the offering of Christ. Is that is that the orthodox position? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it took me a long time. I mean, even after I became orthodox, like it took a long time for me for that to click because I grew up with this idea that the Old Testament is all about God the Father. And then all of a sudden in the New Testament, it's like, hey, here's this guy. He's just been hanging out playing Xbox in the back or, you know, the son of God here. You like, just where did that come from? And, you know, there was, there was some prophecies about the Messiah, but like, where did, you know, and why is he divine? Uh, you know, it's just kind of tradition or something. If that's the view that you have, I mean, I think it does make, it does raise a lot of questions about the Trinity. Blessed are you. Okay. So doctor, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're not watching 50 minutes of it. Just the first 50 seconds. If you guys are interested in that, okay, I highly recommend um, you uh, checking it out sometime, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the link to it uh, in the chat. There you go. So, Bo Branson, he, he did his doctoral thesis on the monarchical Eastern view of the Doctrine of the Trinity. There's more than one model. I think the Eastern... Eastern version does better. Go ahead. He's he's really um, in his dissertation. He's actually addressing um, Unitarians and the uh, Dale Tuggy because um, Dale Tuggy is becoming a pretty popular Unitarian right now, yeah. um, and and he's just kind of ripping apart this more social understanding of the Trinity um, right. as distinctly that. And and one thing to mention real quick is that. There are <laughs> multiple ways to understand the word God. And I think mm -hmm. this is what one thing that Bro Branson does a good job of. He's going to say, look, when we say the word God, there, there's going to be the definition of one source, right? Which there's one principle, right? One, one source of all things, and that is the Father. Mm -hmm. And of course, we believe in the eternal procession outside time and space, right? But there's also this understanding that you are gods, like when Jesus says that to everybody, you are gods. And like Athanasius says, God became man so that we might become God as on taking on the divine nature. So this participation aspect of becoming God. Um, and furthermore, there's the functional aspect of God because the sons of God um are going to be like the the um the rulers over the nations so if you've been watching anything we've been doing uh we've talked about in deuteronomy how the nations got split up into 70 and they were assigned gods michael is assigned to israel and he is sort of the ruler over israel right to help them and so there is this governing aspect to um the word god so there's there's a source there's this uh, divine nature aspect of participation, and then there's this functional aspect of governing uh, as mm -hmm. a way of saying that you're a god. 
Mm -hmm. um, so you got to be careful on, well, in what way, what do we mean when we say the word God in each particular context? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So out there. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Jeff R has got a question. Sorry if this is a dumb question. It, it's not. Um, is Unitarian the same as modalist? So Unitarian is not modalist. Uh, it's, I guess you could, some people would argue that, you know, modalism is a form of Unitarianism. Unitarianism is the belief that there's only, you know, one power, right? We're going to use that term. There's only one power. Um, and um, so Jesus is not God. He's not, he's not divine. Some will say he's an elephant. Lord have mercy with my hiccups. Like he's a, he's um, a savior though, you know? Right. He's a savior, right? But he's not actually God. Um, modalism, which is, I, I, I grew up in a modalist uh, sect, um, is this idea that the father becomes the son, right? Um, or that the Holy Ghost and the father are exactly the same. There's no distinction. It's just, it's just a term of uh, uh, water, functional, ice. you know, water, ice, you know, vapor, things like this. Um people have said really the idea uh, in modalism is that God, the father became a man in Jesus Christ. So the good thing about modalists is that they, um, they believe that Jesus is God, right? Uh, bad thing about modalism. Uh, I, I don't think it does. It doesn't do justice, justice to the fullness of the biblical revelation of God. Right. Um, so hopefully that uh, answers your questions. Uh, Jehovah's witnesses would certainly be considered uh, Unitarian. Um, you know, so yeah. Uh, Hebrew doesn't say face. It says faces as in you have our faces. God has not a face, but or faces that was relevant somewhere in there. Yeah. So, uh, what he's, what he's pointing out is that the word, uh, for presence or face is panin, which is a plural word, right? The I am ending is a plural word. So, uh, good job. Napoleon, uh, bony sharts <laughs> <laughs> like Elohim. Right. Elohim, right? Elohim is a plural word, right? So, um, and that's, that's good. So, so, um, uh, secondly, notice the, okay. Um, uh, okay. So there's that. Okay. So secondly, notice, uh, in the Daniel seven text, uh, the divine descriptions of the ancient of days, particularly there's thrones, there's fire, you know what I mean? Um, you got the son of man coming in on the cloud and, and all this stuff. Right. And then thirdly, it may be worth noting that the fire rushes forth from the throne of the ancient of days. Right. So you've got this stream of fire coming out of the ancient of days is thrones. Uh, do, uh, Father, Dr. Stephen Slaris, who was my priest when I uh, first became Orthodox, believe that this is a reference to the Holy Spirit, that the spirit that is coming from the, uh, the, the, the fire is coming forth from the throne is reference to the Holy ghost. Uh, and also notice that the fire proceeds from the throne of David, uh, the throne of the ancient of days alone. Right. Which, uh, he, he takes to mean is, uh, you know, evidence against the filioque. I don't want to get into that conversation right now, but, um, and as we mentioned before, there were three powers traditions as well, as described in the book, three powers in heaven, which was recently published, um, you know, which we, indicated upwards. Okay. So, um, so concerning the visual and auditory theophanic modes, uh, Andre Orlov writes this, uh, Merrill Willis noted that as the deity bestows on the human, like one, right. The one, like the son of man, human, like one, uh, dominion and glory, divine prerogatives becomes visible. The human, like one brings to full visibility in the sight of the nations, the glory of the most high. This insightful comment accentuates one of the essential features of the joint theophanies. When the, quote, visibility of the deity is gradually transferred to the second power, who will eventually become the image of the invisible God. Of course, at the starting point of this important conceptual trajectory is Daniel 7. The deity is still far away from being invisible, right? So in other words, in Daniel 7, you see both Ancient of Days and you know, the son of man, right? You see both powers, but eventually again, that image is of the, of the first power is going to recede. He's going to be an auditory expression, booming voice in heaven type thing. Right. Um, and then also lastly, the one who rides on the cloud for cloud for Israel was reserved uh, solely for Yahweh. Other religions has Zeus and Baal riding on the clouds. And we see this in the Psalter. Oh, Yahweh, my God, you are very great. You clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. You who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a tent curtain, the one who sets beams in the waters for his upper chambers, who makes clouds his chariots, 
who rides on the wings of the wind, who makes his messengers the winds, his attendants a flame of fire. Um, the, r- this, there's a couple things. I, actually, I probably should have highlighted this, but um, but yeah, we have this imagery of God riding on the on the clouds. There's more than just this. Good afternoon, Brother Philip. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Join his YouTube channel and support this man. He's awesome. Um, he's planting a church uh, and producing all of the equipment for his church um, out there. Uh, he made his own iconostas and everything. It's beautiful. St. Zenia's Chapel. Everyone pray for St. Z- uh, J- uh, Zenia's Chapel and the church that, uh, that they're planting in Maine. So uh, that all being said, um, this other thing, this uh, attendance of flame of fire, this is going to become relevant later. So keep in your mind this idea, this uh, the the idea of of God's angels being associated with fire. Uh, we could also remember, right, the, the angel of the Lord appearing in the burning bush, right? Things like that. Remember this concept; it's going to become relevant later. Um, okay, so AI made this image, and it is dope. Okay, <laughs> like just look at it. So this is the exegoge of Ezekiel, the tragedian, the exaltation of Moses. Okay. And um, this is so unique. You know, Cornell, why don't you, why don't you take this one? Um, you know, we talk about the picture. I mean, you got the, the, the way we're uh, interpreting is this is Moses on the throne with mm-hmm. his rod. And then here we have Moses below um, parting the seas, the Red Sea, like he's going through. Um, and mm-hmm. then, of course, you got the clouds as his uh, chariot. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's... Uh, it's an awesome picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, though, what's happening here is we have Moses above and below at the same time. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's imperative, right? Yeah. Um, because dream, his vision. Yeah. Right. This is a vision, right? Um, and uh, I really love the animals up there because it really shows the whole, um, you know, like the cherubim, the seraphim, right? Uh, AI did a great job with this image i'm i'm so impressed with it sometimes sometimes i'm not very impressed sometimes i'm very frustrated with it but sometimes it pulls out a banger like this and it's awesome yeah. so uh, so this is the exo uh, exagage um uh by ezekiel the tragedy and this is not ezekiel the prophet this is a writer and he uh, basically takes the book of exodus and, and makes it into a play right um and it's got dialogue he goes back and forth it's really really neat um, and basically it's a retelling of Exodus, but it's got this interesting, uh, sequence here that's unique. And then there's also a bit about a Phoenix at the end that's unique as well. Not part of the Exodus narrative, but this is really cool. So go ahead again, just to recast things. This is again, showing examples of a figure becoming a second power like a human becoming a second power or what have you that, that that is the idea and so what andre orlov right now is doing is saying here's an example here's an example right mm-hmm. so so we'll just kind of go through this and show the first example being daniel right the son of man in the ancient of days okay and then here's uh one where we have um moses so i'll just read this this section here that i think is really the the most important part of the tragedy in here. So Mm -hmm. I had a vision of a great throne on the top of Mount Sinai and it reached to the folds of heaven. A noble man was sitting on it. Again, this is a vision Moses is having. It's like a dream and he's telling um, his colleague about it. And he says with a crown and a large scepter in his left hand, he beckoned to me with his right hand. So I approached and stood before the throne. He gave me the scepter and instructed me to sit on the great throne. Then he gave me the royal crown and got up from the throne. I behold, beheld the whole earth all around and saw beneath the earth and above the heavens. A multitude of stars fell before my knees and I counted them all. They paraded past me like a battalion of men. Then I woke from my sleep in fear. Um, Really interesting story. Again, we see um, this figure like, like the Ancient of Days on his throne beckoning Moses to come forward and start taking on these divine attributes, these divine functions, scepter, throne, royal crown, 
Um, and then also this idea of the stars falling before him, right? And the stars um, definitely are pointing to angels. Angels. Yeah. Angels are worshiping him, okay? That's really important um, to understand that he is made above the angels, and the angels are now worshiping him, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, what else do we got here, Justin, if we scroll down? Yeah, well, I want to I want to point out one other thing, which yeah. is um, this this is also a motif of you know the 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 prophet or the seer, right? As um, uh, Andre Orlov likes to use the term seer, the seer sees a vision of a divine being, and then it is revealed to the seer that he is the divine being, right? And this is something that will show up later um, as well. So it's like him seeing himself as a divine being. This is why he wakes up and he's like terrified. Like, what did I just dream? Right? Like, what? <laughs> so it's very, it's, it's very interesting. So this is kind of the exaltation of Moses. Um, and we'll, we'll keep. And and uh, one one other thing, um, I want to point out. I guess um, this dream is very much like the dream of Joseph, right? Right. And he has this dream of his brothers bowing down before him, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, his brothers are envious. Yeah, very mad, very upset about this. I don't like this idea that I'm going to worship him or bow down before him. No thanks. And um, that will also come in later. <laughs> and also, Moses is a very interesting figure because he is establishing that first covenant, and we see his life the way it's played out is parallel to Christ's own life, you know, Christ being taken out of Egypt and then leading Israel in the wilderness, Jesus fast for 40 days after his baptism, his Exodus experience. I mean, the parallels between Jesus and Moses is um, striking Yeah, all the way through the whole life of Moses and the whole life of Jesus. We can find um, parallels. So um, Moses is a type of Christ. Okay. I want to point that out. Yeah, absolutely. And then also, I think it's maybe worth noting that this uh, vision in the context of the story is when Abraham is not Abraham, when Moses is going up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. Right. So this vision is almost like he is both the receiver of the Ten Commandments and the giver of the Ten Commandments. Right. Uh, Very, very interesting, very surreal stuff. So uh, then we have the book of the similitudes. Right. So uh, the book of the uh, similitudes is in Ethiopian Enoch. I don't own Ethiopian Enoch. I only have the Greek version. And so the Greek version is a lot smaller than the Ethiopian version. So this is why it's titled the book of of the similitudes. This is Enoch ascending into heaven. Um, Also another uh, AI generated image. So uh, we see here and and Michael and Raphael and Gabriel and Phanuel. Raphael appears in the book of Tobit, so he is a canonical angel in the Orthodox Church. So, and Michael and Raphael and Gabriel and Phanuel and many holy angels without number came out from that house and with them the head of days. Now, the reason why this phrase head of days appears, why head of days, why not ancient of days? Um, the word for head and for ancient in Greek is arche, right? So the Ethiopians translated that word RK as head of days, um, but the underlying Greek word would have been the same, uh, RK of days, the, the ancient of days. So and with them, the head of days, his head white and pure like wool. We've seen this already in Daniel chapter seven and his garments indescribable. And I fell upon my face and my whole body melted and my spirit was transformed. And I cried out in a loud voice in the power in the spirit of power. And I blessed and praised and exalted. And these blessings which came out from my mouth were pleasing before the head of days. And the head of days came with Michael and Gabriel, Phanuel, right? Raphael and Phanuel, and thousands and ten thousands of angels without number. And he, that angel, came to me and greeted me with his voice and said to me, You are the Son of Man who is born to righteousness and righteousness remains over you and the righteousness of the head of days will not leave you. Okay. So it's important to keep in mind in Enoch, right? This is, we're not, 
we're not showing you the whole image in Enoch. Enoch has visions of the son of man. Okay. He has visions of the son of man. And here in this part, it's revealed that he is the son of man. Okay. Um, now this is only, this only appears in the Ethiopic uh, version, but um, that's, it, that's interesting because it, it kind of goes back with this exegoge of Moses um, or exegoge of Ezekiel, the, the, uh, what do you call it? The uh, elevation of Moses or whatever. Um, here, again, Enoch, who sees the Son of Man, the vision of the Son of Man, is revealed to be the Son of Man. And also, you see this transformation, right? This is a glorification. My whole body melted, right? My spirit was transformed. I cried out in a loud voice in the spirit of power, right? Uh, something dramatic. It almost reminds me of Werewolf, you know, like that transformation in that Michael Jackson uh, video. It's like right? meta, it's like a metamorphosis. You know, it's a metamorphosis. It looks yeah. painful, right? <laughs> um, and so that's you know that's cool. And I would just say the one one other thing. Um, he greeted me with his voice. You are the Son of Man. Um, yeah. this idea of going back to this oracular centric, right? This, this vocal um, invisible figure now, and it seems as though he's taking on the uh, visible expression of this um, invisible God. Right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And should also, which we're not going to get into a bunch here, because we're going to talk about this later, mm -hmm. but when we read new Testament passages like transfiguration, baptism we'll see voice and all that stuff like show great continuity but i don't want to get into that right now but we should be keeping that in our forefronts as as christians anyways right that this is right. going to be happening so absolutely so this is a primary adam books um uh this is a image of satan cast out from heaven what, what is this image from who did this one um, I don't know. Just search for it and thought it looked cool. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, why don't you, why don't you take over this one? Cause I know you're very passionate about this one. Oh yeah. Um, so there's just so much here that I, it's like, almost like, where do I begin? How do I start chomping on all this meat? Do I start on this corner or this corner? Um, there's a lot to be had here guys. So just kind of bear with me. Um, Let's kind of go just through some of the text here, if that's all right. So, so he was considered, Satan was considered a second power. Okay. Ooh, this is weird. All right. Um, but I, I think this one, once we kind of chomp through it, you'll, you'll see what's going on here. Okay. Um, it says the adversary exclaims that he was expelled and alienated from his glory, which he had in heaven in the midst of the angels. Notably, in both the Latin and Armenian versions, Satan's former condition is described as a dwelling of light, where he was endowed with glory. In the Latin and the Georgian versions, his demotion is described as a casting out from the face of God. Satan also appears to be associated with the attribute of the divine throne, and he utters the following enigmatic statement. I was alienated from the throne of the cherubim, who, having spread out a shelter, used to enclose me. Um... And so, basically, the Satan figure becomes this former favorite, demoted second power, right? He was enclosed um, by these cherubim. He was on the throne, right? And he was basically demoted. Yeah, and this 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 idea of the th their wings enclosing him. This is uh, Ark of the Covenant type language, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where if you look at the Ark of the Covenant, you've got the cherubim and their wings are stretched out towards each other. And they're, it, it, the idea is that the Ark of the Covenant is a throne of God, right? And so the angels are covering that throne of God um, in the Ark, right? Uh, and so the idea is that Satan is an image of that, right? Um, so yeah, and there's yeah. there's multiple ways to look at this, but um, you know, we have Satan saying, "I'm going to lift my throne above your throne," type language. So he had a throne of some kind, 
right because he says i'm gonna put my throne above yours so if we understand like heiser and others like the this divine council worldview you have thrones there mm -hmm. and he may have been this sort of high throne figure and he may have been the second power and he's saying well, let me notch up here now right i want to be the first power okay i want to be the source right yeah. love this love this image right here this is a really important i think this image really depicts what we're going to be talking about next so you have on the left we're going to call this michael the archangel on the right we're going to call this satan and in the center we're going to call this the adam an edemic ad figure right okay right very good all right um just to kind of go through some of this text here okay um, I think all this stuff is just good meat and potatoes. So Eve was already um, kicked out of paradise and the devil is playing with her, messing with her and entrapping her and lying to her. And she is getting ticked. And she says, why do you assault us for nothing? What have you to do with us? What have we done to you that you should pursue us with deceit? Why does your malice fall on us? Have we stolen your glory? Made you to be without honor? Why do you treacherously and enviously pursue us, O enemy, all the way to death? The devil responds, O Adam. Adam meaning dust, earth. Okay, that's important. Right. Adama. He's, okay. Yeah, he's not, he's not referring, he's not talking we'll to, to Adam. Yeah, he's calling her Adam. Yeah, so what this is important, the, this idea, the way that the devil refers to man as Adam, dust. All my enmity and envy and sorrow concern you, since because of you, I am expelled and deprived of my glory, which I had in the heavens, in the midst of the angels. Remember, he was enclosed with the angels. He had his throne. And because of you, I was cast out onto earth. Adam the mass, what he has done to the devil, and he responds, Adam, what are you telling me? It is because of you that I have been thrown out of, out of there. When you were created, I was cast out from the presence of God and was sent out from the fellowship of the angels. I was in this council with God. I had my throne there. And because of you, I'm no longer there. Right. Hmm. Well, why is, why, why is Adam the reason why Satan is no longer there? What, what happened? Right. Uh, That's uh yeah. So, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So this is uh this is from the Wisdom of Solomon chapter two, um, verses twenty three through twenty four. This is canonical in the Orthodox Church in the scripture. Uh for God created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of his own eternity. Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world, and they that do hold of his side do find it. Right. If you hold on to the devil's side, you will find death. Right. And so, again, we have this affirmation of the image of God. Right. Um, that, we, that we are created in attached directly to the envy of Satan. OK. OK. Yeah. Image of his own eternity. OK. Yes. Yeah. That's really, 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 really important. OK. Yeah. Um, all right. So when God breathed his spirit into you, you received the likeness of his image. Thereupon Michael came and made you bow down before God. Mm -hmm. The image of God in man, <laughs> Orlov, is basically saying this, right? Right in, in page 25. The image of God, man becomes this icon so that angels can now worship God. Not just venerate, but actually worship God through Adam. Worship the image of God in man is the idea, right? Now, it's also important to note then at this point, then the, the, the first power is receded, right? He's totally invisible, right? Mm -hmm. There's no there's no visibility to be had. That's the motivation for why God creates Adam because he's invisible. He creates Adam. Go ahead. Yeah, so Adam becomes an icon for God in which angels are to worship God the Father through, is what I'll say, right? Right. 
um, it's um, really fascinating, the, this idea that finally now we have this image in which we can worship God is, is sort of the depiction being put up. And Michael is saying, all right, now we're going to go bow down and worship God. Here's his image. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. God said to Michael, behold, I have made Adam in the likeness of my image. Then Michael summoned all the angels and God said to them, come bow down to God whom I made. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's keep going down here. Michael himself worshiped first. Then he called and said, worship the image of God, Jehovah. I answered, this is Satan. I do not have it within me to worship Adam. Yes. When, when Michael compelled me to worship, I said to him, why do you compel me? I will not worship him who is lower and later than me. I am prior to that creature. Before he was made, I had already been made. He ought to worship me. Hearing this, other angels who were under me were unwilling to worship him. So one thing that's really important to mark out here is Michael is saying, worship the image of God. Right. Satan is saying, I'm not going to worship Adam. Dirt. Dirt, dust. Mm -hmm. So this gets into some of the things that we were talking about in previous um sessions we've talked about this idea of seeing the veil and seeing what is beyond the object to the subject okay and i want to break that down a little bit um the idea is that the image of god the perfect image of the invisible god is worthy of worship okay. and it's not it is not the humanity that Michael is saying to um, Satan to worship. He's saying, worship the image of God. So Adam becomes, okay, this is going to be a word that you're going to have to hold on to, but Adam becomes an idol, right? This, um, this uh, figure in which the image of God dwells in. And so when you see throughout the Old Testament, people worshiping Baal or whatever their other gods, they would create this, their own image, right, of like a golden ox or what have you, and then the god would then go dwell within the idol, whatever that's a golden calf or what have you, right? And I think it's important to note that the priest would breathe into the face or breathe into the nose of that yep. idol, right? So the the idol was not truly the god until after the priest breathed into the nose. So it was animated by the god. Right. So right. before it's just a, a nice statue right right it's a nice golden statue but when when they go through this process um the idea is that the god then enters the idol right right and so what we have here is man is the temple of god right that, that this is christian language we have and referring to ourselves however where we're going to be careful is understanding Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God. We're not. Right. So he we're is, we're, we're made in the image of God. He is the image of God. So the word in John actually says he is the icon of God. That right. is the Greek word icon. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> Satan refuses and says, Nope, this is just a man. I'm not going to worship a man. But Michael's saying, worship the image of God. Right. Really important. Okay. Um, do you so, want to get this? Go ahead. Yep. I'll, I'll take this. So um, this tradition uh, actually is preserved in the Quran. Okay. Yep. Um, so while we don't have this in the Bible, uh, Muslims are going to be... Um, uh, aware of this tradition because it is in the Quran. And I think it's it's useful for dialogue with Muslims uh, for you to be aware of this concept, right? But there is an, an important, a vitally important um, distinction, and we're going to get into that. So this right. is the uh, this is the seventh chapter of the Quran. 
Um, and it's called Al Aruf. I don't know Arabic, so Al Araf, something like that. Um, in English, it means the elevations. It's Quran chapter seven. Um, and we're going to read a bit of the Quran today. All right. So obviously, if you are to wear, this is not orthodox. Um, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we created you, then we shaped you. Then we said to the angels, bow down before Adam. So they bowed down, except for Satan. He was not of those who bowed down. He said, what prevented you from bowing down when I have commanded you? He said, I am better than he. You created me from fire, and you created him from mud. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> no, it's heresy. So, yeah, All exactly. Right. So um, <laughs> it says, uh, uh, you created me from fire, you created him from mud. Now, remember earlier I had mentioned the ministers of a flame of fire. Right? He makes his ministers a flame of fire, right? Uh, the association of angels with fire, even in the um, uh, the burning bush, right? This is important to keep in mind. So he says, you created me from fire. You created him from mud. He said, and then he said, this is Allah. Allah said, get down from it. It is not for you to act arrogantly in it. Get out. You are one of the lowly. He said, give me respite. So Satan says, give me respite. Until the day they are resurrected. He's, and then Allah said, you are of those given respite. And uh, Satan says, he said, because you have lured me, I will waylay them on your straight path. Then I will come at them from before them and from behind them and from their right and from their left. And you will not find most of them appreciative. And Allah said, get out of it, despised and vanquished. Whoever among them follows you, I will fill up hell with you all. Okay, so um, there's a couple of things, right? What is this it, right? Yeah, go ahead and talk about the it part, and I'll <laughs> get into the, some of the other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. So what is this it, right? He says, uh, get down from it. It is not for you to act arrogantly in it. Get out. You are one of the lonely, right? Um, he says, uh, again, get out of it, despised and vanquished. It, what is it? Well, uh, some translations of the Quran will say paradise, right? Get out of paradise, right? It wasn't created for you. But um, the word paradise is not in the Arabic text whatsoever, right? Um, and we have here a quote from Ibn Kathir, who says, he notes, because you defied my command and disobeyed me, get out. It is not for you to be arrogant here in paradise, according to the scholars of Tafsir. But Ibn Kathir says it could also refer to a particular status which he held in the utmost highs, particular status, throne. Right? Get out of the throne. This throne does not exist for you to be arrogant towards me. Angels are no longer going to enclose you. You're right. You get out. If you, get out. If you if you can't worship the image of God and man, which I want to bring up, if we scroll up a little bit here, up. Yep. Bow yep. down before Adam. We. <laughs> well, th that's not what we have in uh, in our text. Right. No, we have bow down before the image <laughs> of God. Right. And the person who calls him Adam. Satan is Satan. <laughs> he is the one demoting the what, what we have before our eyes here. The right. icon of God that we worship. Mm -hmm. The perfect image of the invisible God that we worship. He demotes and says, well, this is just man. I don't worship him. Right. Nonetheless, it's interesting that it's in the Quran that um, God is, is Satan. The one it is Satan who uh, refuses to worship a man. Right. Right. And it's mm. God who, and it's God who demotes him to Adam. Right. Yeah. But also yeah. just this um, understanding that it seems like Allah is okay with the angels worshiping man. Right. Um, 
to put him above the angels. But the reason being that we say that man is worthy of of worship, right? The what we would say Christ mm -hmm. is because he's the perfect image of the invisible God. Right. And you'll notice that in this text, there's no reference to the image of God. No. Right. So in the Quran, you have God no longer referring to Adam, right? As the image of God. You have God referring to Adam as Adam. And then Satan basically agreeing with God saying, He's mud, right? Which is Adam, right? <laughs> um, I don't want to worship Adam. I don't want to worship uh, this mud, right? Um, and so it's interesting. It's very interesting. Um, and again, this is sort of too powersy, right? It's, it's very interesting, right? Uh, this, Satan expelled. Yeah. Yeah. This is my, in a way, idol where I am being presented inside. And you're to worship me through it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, Muslims are not very happy with the fact that we worship Jesus. Right. Why? Because he's just a man. So hmm, maybe you're so, agreeing with Satan. You're agreeing with the devil. <laughs> you know, you're basically saying, right, <laughs> I'm not going to worship Jesus because he's just a man. He's mud. He's a man. He's at. Well, he's a, he, he's a prophet. He, maybe, maybe he's born of a virgin, <laughs> but he's but he's mud. If you are saying that you cannot worship Jesus because he's man, you are agreeing with the devil, <laughs> right? That's what's happening. So, uh, right, exactly, there's Jeff. There's, exactly, there's more. Jeff. <laughs> there's more. We're, we ain't done. Right? Yeah, we'll keep going. <laughs> no, there's there, there's more poofs. To yeah, be, yeah. Uh, to be yeah. had here. <laughs> so, uh, shift from divine encouragement to divine opposition. So, this here is the Babylonian Talmud. Okay. Uh, and it's not even the whole thing, right? This is just a collection of it, um, uh, which we're going to see this. So, all right. So, this is, um, uh, this is from Orlov. Okay. And I've restructured the sentences a little bit. Anywhere that you see brackets, you can see that I've restructured uh, the sentence to make it a little bit shorter and to make it a little bit more clear. Um, so be aware of that. Also, this phrase here, a divine voice, is actually a Hebrew phrase that I just translated. Um, so be aware of that. Okay. Also, for some reason, quotation marks were weird, so I had to add quotation marks. So anywhere you see brackets, you'll see I modified the text. You can go to page one on Orlov's book and read it for yourself and, and just check the integrity of what I've done. Okay? So, upon receiving a vision of the great angel Metatron, Elisha ben Avuya, known also as Aher, uttered the following. It is taught as a tradition that on high there is no sitting, and no emulation, and no back, and no weariness. So what's he saying? God doesn't have a body. Okay? So he sees the, the angel Metatron, and he sees that he has a back, and he's sitting, right? And, you know, doing stuff, and he doesn't get, you know. So he says, on high, God has no image. It is taught that there's no image, right? And, then he, and when he sees Metatron, he says, perhaps God forfend, there are two divinities. And God banished Aher beyond the boundaries of the tradition. As the Hagiga says, a divine voice went forth. A divine voice. Do we see a visible God? No. No. One power. One power. A divine voice went forth and said, return ye backslidden children except Ahar. And, okay. So return ye backsliding children except Ahar. Everyone He's else. saying repent. Besides this guy. Everybody else repent. Everybody repent. Come back to me. But not that guy. <laughs> okay? <laughs> we can turn. stay. <laughs> you can stay far away from me. Right? <laughs> and Aher responded, since I've been driven forth from yonder world, I've been driven forth from heaven, God won't accept me anymore. Let me go forth and enjoy this world. So Ahar went forth in evil courses. In other words, he lived a sinful life from then on because he knew there was no possibility that god would um uh, forgive him for believing him. in this two powers yeah exactly 
So notice that the Metatron is depicted. God is a disembodied voice, okay? Uh, and the Metatron and God are not equal. So if you go back to the very first slide, Alan Siegel said that the essence of the two powers theory or the heresy was that an angelic being or a man who's been elevated is equal to God, okay? So at this point, now in the tradition, Metatron is depicted. God is not, you know, the Ancient of Days is not depicted at all in imagery whatsoever. He is just a disembodied voice, and there is no equality whatsoever to be had uh, between the Metatron, right, or the, you know, the second power and the first power, okay? And so this is the, uh, this is the telos, right? This is the end of the road for Jewish uh, two-power theology, right? This is the end of the trajectory um, after rejecting the previous established orthodoxy, right? Why did they... Why did they eventually reject the previous established orthodoxy, right? Um, well, we'll get into that, I guess, right? So it says, uh, the Jewish tradition changes radically, this is me, uh, from God encouraging the veneration of men to forbidding it, okay? Uh, and from recognizing several different biblical and angelic figures as a second power to God, not except uh, to not, oh, sorry, hold on. From recognizing several biblical uh, and angelic figures as a second power to God, to not accepting the repentance of those who hold to such accounts, right? So um, used to be, right, Moses being divine, that was fine. Enoch being divine, that was fine. Um, Adam being divine, that was fine. To now, no, can't have any of that. Mm -hmm. That's off right. the table. That's gone, right? Um, so... Um, as mentioned previously, scholars of the two powers debates note that while in some accounts the two powers complement each other, and uh, in other accounts they oppose each other. Siegel, for example, says that in early accounts, after exhibiting, uh, often exhibit com complementary relationships between two powers, while later ones are often filled with polemical overtones. An example of this shift occurs in the evolution of the aforementioned story of Adam's elevation. And veneration by angels. <laughs> it's funny. What? What's funny? The story. Uh, oh yeah, the, 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 the story. Jewish story. How they rewrite it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So while in early pseudepigraphal accounts, God favors the protoplast exaltation and veneration. Protoplast. Come on, bro. So it just means I, form. It means the first formed, the first created. Okay, I had no idea what that meant. I had to look that up. So while in early pseudepigraphal accounts, uh, God favors the protoplast exaltation and veneration. In later rabbinical accounts, he opposes such obedience by the celestial citizens. Rabbis were familiar with such a motif and took an active role in subverting it. One can see evidence of this subversive energy in the numerous rabbinic for stories that polemicize against any of, uh, act of veneration towards Adam. So polemics is attacking, right? It's the, rhetoric to attack an idea. So okay? the, they're becoming iconoclasts. They're becoming iconoclasts, like the Muslims later became like totally mm -hmm. iconic. You, you know, you, Muslims can't even draw anime characters, right? Because you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to make any images whatsoever. Right. Um, a particularly good example of this is the story found in, in Gen Rab 8.10, which is a rabbinic source. I don't quite understand how that works, but uh, in which the angels mistake Adam for God and almost shout holy before him. So the angels, See Adam, okay, mistaken for God, and they're about to go, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, Lord of hosts. He's about they're about to say that. And then God averts this error by casting a deep sleep on Adam so that his mortal nature would be evident. This example was then compared by our Hashaya to a parable in which a okay, to a parable in which a king and his governor go forth in a chariot together. The subjects of the king wish to acclaim the king as Dominus, Lord. But the king, anxious about his citizens mistaking the governor for him, quickly pushes the governor from the chariot. Hence, there is no ambiguity about just who was to be proclaimed Lord. So they're rewriting <laughs> stories of, let me, let me put Adam asleep. Let me kick the second power off the throne. Let's make sure we get this out of our tradition here. Right. Right. It's Absolutely. very obvious that there is a motive to get rid of their tradition 
that was fulfilled in Christ. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Retro Orthodox. He says, uh, this is David. Uh, there are some practices that show evidence of their former theology, though, as some ultra Orthodox Jews practice intercessions of their forefathers. That's like yes. Maccabean. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, uh, all right. So we're going to go to some church fathers here. Um, and we'll get to some more applications to some of the stuff too. Okay. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So this is my patron saint, St. Justin. Uh, I have this icon. Thank you, Chad. You're such a Chad. Um, so St. Justin, the martyr. All right. This is in his dialogue with Trifo the Jew. So he is uh, walking on the beach, right? And he's speaking to a Jew. And uh, this is a written account. He's retelling this account, the arguments that he heard from Jews and, and, and going back and forth. It's, it's a polemical account. And this is early. <laughs> this is know. early. Right. So Justin Martyr, is, he dies in the second century. Okay. He dies around 180 AD. Okay. He was a student of Polycarp and who was a student of the Apostle John. Okay. So he's one generation removed from the Apostle John. He says, I shall give you another testimony, my friends, from the scriptures that God begot before all creatures a beginning, a certain rational power from himself, who is called by the Holy Spirit, sometimes the glory of the Lord. That's uh, Kavod, right? Um, we didn't mention it. It's a big theme uh, in Orla's voice, uh, it, Kavod. It's the word for glory. So when you look up. And you see Satan being cast from his glory and all this stuff about glory. That's Kavod. Okay. So here, Doxa, Doxa right? So here, um, uh, Justin is saying that sometimes this person is called the glory of the Lord, right? Others, son. Uh, others, the son. Others, the wisdom. Others, an angel. And then God, right? So sometimes he's called God, right? In the sense of, uh, uh, Exodus chapter three, um, where I think it's three fifteen. No, that's Genesis three fifteen. So it's Exodus chapter three, where the angel in the bush says, "I am the God of uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob." And then Lord and Logos, Logos meaning Word. Okay. And on another occasion, he calls himself Captain when he appeared in human form to Joshua, the son of Nun, Captain of the Lord's army. Right. Um. So. There's this figure that Justin is identifying as the pre-incarnate Logos. But in, in Justin's mind, okay, this is important. This is, a, this is a difference, okay, between the way that Christians understood the second power and the way that the Jews identified the second power. Again, who's that Pokemon, okay? You have, who's that Pokemon? You've got this divine... A uh, shadowy figure, and they're like, okay, well, maybe it's Moses, and maybe it's Enoch, or maybe you know, maybe it's different people sort of taking turns on this throne, right? Uh, you know, and elevating. No, for Justin, this person, God begot before all creatures a beginning. So before anything was created, right? Let's keep this in mind. Before all creatures, what is a creature? Well, the sky, the earth, the moon, the stars, space, time, matter. Okay. So before anything existed, God begets his son. This is known as the eternally begotten son dogma. Okay. This right here in Justin, very early Christian theology. Okay. So God, before all creatures, uh, uh, begot before all creatures a beginning. And he's identified as the glory of the Lord, the Son, the wisdom of God, the angel of God, God. He's called God. He's called Lord. He's called the Word of God, the Logos, right? He he's even everywhere appears filling all things. He's everywhere filling all things. And this is who becomes a man in Jesus Christ, okay? It's not, as in the other powers, a man who gets exalted. No, this is a God who becomes man. This is a God who, who condescends to our humanity, taking on our nature. Okay, to save us. This is not a righteous man who's super cool who gets exalted. This is God becoming man to save us and restore us to the proper place where we belong above the stars. Okay, so if there's anything to be said about this exaltation language that we're seeing, human beings being exalted, it's us 
being exalted. This is the cult of the saints, the Virgin Mary, Saint Justin the Martyr, Saint uh, Gate, you know, Saint uh, we are Basil. We the ones that he adopted. Christ is not adopted. Christ is begotten. Okay, Christ has always been and will always be, but we are adopted, and we are called adopted, right? Um, to the apostle John says in, in the prologue to those who believe on his name, he gave power to become the sons of God. Um, the apostle Paul go says, I'm sorry, go inheritors. Go ahead. Yeah. Co inheritors. Yeah, exactly. Co inheritors. Um, the apostle Paul says that we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba father. We can call God father, right? Abba daddy, because we are adopted. We are elevated. Christ is not adopted. Christ has always been. And so this is where we have to say, no, the, um, the, this is where we depart, right? Our trajectory departs from this Jewish tradition. The Jews. And from depart- Arians. Yes. And from Arians. Right. So, you know, what, like, as I mentioned before, there were some uh, Christian heretics who held on to these Jewish traditions and just said, oh yeah, Jesus was an exalted man, like Moses, like Enoch, like that, 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 right? But no, what's taught in the scriptures is that Jesus is God. And what is taught in the fathers is that Jesus is God, has always been God, will always be God. And that's, I think that's imperative. So uh, go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. No, dude, that was beautiful. Um, yeah. It has always been his inheritance, always. Mm-hmm. And now he's inviting us yes. along that everything that I have is yours. All is yours in Christ. How? Mm -hmm. Well, it's his already. It's we that are now grafted in and made part of this family. Mm -hmm. And it is the um, fallen angels who have lost their glory. Hence why Satan is envious. And we are being, (laughs) we're taking his place. (laughs) Yeah, is the idea when it comes down to it. Um, well, let's scroll down a little bit to this next part here. Some good stuff here. Mm-hmm. So this is St. Basil the Great. I'll let you take this one. Okay. So this is extremely vital and important to understand as well. Okay. Yo, you don't have a mic. Hello. Let's see, is my mic in here? Yep, you're good. Well, no, I don't think it's your mic. I think that's your um, yeah, that's your computer my, mic. My, no, there it yeah, is. Yep. You're good now. You're good. Um, so, so that according to the distinction of persons in the Trinity, both are one and one, according to the community of nature, one. How then, if one and one, are there not two gods? Because we speak of a king and of the king's image and not two kings. The majesty is not cloven in two, nor the glory divided. Really important. The sovereignty and authority over us is one. And so the doxology ascribed by us is not plural, but one. Because the honor paid to the image passes on to the prototype. Now what in the one case the image is by reason of imitation, that in the other case the son is by nature. And as in works of art, like the, the likeness is dependent on the form. So in the case of the divine and uncompounded nature, the union consists in the communion of the Godhead. When we are worshiping Jesus, we are worshiping God. Period. Absolutely. And this is, this is the Carmen Christi. Right? And this idea that when you, so you see this in the life of Adam, When the angels say, behold, the image of God, we're talking about the perfect image of the invisible God. Not just an image, the image. And what he's saying is the honor paid to the image passes on to the prototype. When we worship the Lord Jesus Christ, it is to the glory of God the Father. Amen, as Paul says. Really beautiful stuff. And it really should tell us something about our own selves as well. Should tell us something about the saints. 
We are made in the image of God. We participate. This is participatory language, okay? We participate in the image of God, okay? So when Jesus says, you have done it to the least of these, you have done it unto me. All of us, in some sense, regardless of how discarded or damaged the image of God might be in us because of sin, the image of God is still there. And so when we do it to the least of these, it's participating and you're doing it unto Christ, the image of God. I hope that makes sense. Your mouth, your mouth is, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And um, it's important. It's important to know that that statement that, and I never, I never saw it this way ever. Right. I never understood this, but when Jesus says, Hey, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Mm -hmm. That is him calling himself God. Yes. Right. Because the idea is that he's the image of God. Right. So um, we, we can talk about, the morality of the death penalty later or whatever. Right. But the, um, the reason why the death penalty comes in play in scripture, right. Is that you killed the image of God. And because you killed the image of God, you, it, that's, that's the worst thing you can do. Right. Murder is the worst thing you can do because you killed the image of God. Right. Abortion is wrong because they are in the image of God. Right. Absolutely. Right. So, um, the, the, This statement that if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me, only makes sense if you understand that Jesus is divine. Because I can't say, I, me, I can't go around saying, oh man, you ripped that guy off. You ripped me off. You know what I mean? I can't go, oh, hey, you punched that guy. You punched me, right? I can't say that, but Christ can. Because he Paul, is Paul, why are you persecuting me? Right, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Right, because Paul was, crucif was, was persecuting the his Christians, bride. his bride, right? And so we, we have this extremely highly exalted understanding of humanity. That humanity created in the image of God is to be prophet, priest, and kings. And when we do things to anybody, we do it under Christ. When we treat somebody with love and dignity and respect... We're restoring that person to their image that they were created in, into the image of God. They are royalty. So when we feed and clothe and help the homeless, we are restoring the image of God in the homeless person. We're venerating them as being made in the image of God. We're seeing them as fearfully and wonderfully created. And this should be our ethic to everybody, to venerate the image of God, to say no to iconoclasm and say yes to the iconic vision that we have received a great inheritance in Christ and in Christ only. And it is only if you worship Christ, do you worship God? If you are worshiping anything outside of Christ, you've missed the image of God. Only Christ is made in the image of God or begotten. Okay. Begotten, Absolutely. not made. So, what does that say to others then, right? That um, do not worship Jesus. In a way, we would say. They're worshiping Satan. Sorry. <laughs> that, well, they're agreeing with Satan. They're, yeah, they're that this is not, them. this is just a man. I'm mm -hmm. not going to worship man. And so, therefore, you're not breaking into the Father. You're not worshiping the Father. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. you are participating in angel worship, which Scripture talks about quite a bit. Right. Yeah. Very good. You're not breaking through to God. Right. If you don't worship Jesus, you're not worshiping God. And Paul saying, oh, don't listen to another angel. It's a false gospel. If another right. angel preaches to you another gospel, another gospel, let him be accursed. Galatians. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Beautiful. Um, all right. So St. Paul, the apostle. Okay. 
Uh, but we speak wisdom among the perfected, though not wisdom of this age or this age's archons, we have been brought to nothing. Rather, we speak of God's wisdom in a mystery which has been hidden away, which God has marked out in advance for our glory before the ages. Hmm. I love this verse. Yeah, go ahead, brother. What is this archon language, by the way? This is a different translation that I would normally use. Right? Yeah, so the the principalities, right? Ah, the powers. Principalities, powers. So these other principalities and powers over the ages, the prince of the air, what have you, right? They have been brought to nothing. All their wisdom, everything you think is good, has been smashed. And this thing that God is doing throughout time, through the seed of Abraham, we have it hidden. So who's that Pokemon? You ain't going to know. God's really good at hide and seek. He's invisible. <laughs> he ain't telling you. Um, He's been hidden away. Had they known his plan, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Mm -hmm. This is hidden. So this Jewish speculation, although perfectly orthodox, was never going to get it 100% right. Mm -hmm. However, Orlov is giving us a Melu, a framework to think about what they were expecting. And what we have is the revelation of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. oh, man. Wow. So what we're going to do is we're going to, because we have, to have, we have uh, quite a few people um, watching, well, I'm going to throw out the invite link. Okay. Um, if you click this link, you'll be able to join us on stage, make any comments that you want to make, um, or ask any questions that you might want to have. Uh, we do not require you to, uh, show your face. So if your hair is messed up, we do want to see you in the back room though. Right. Um, meaning, uh, we'll see your little image, little icon, uh, down here before you bring up on stage, I do want to make sure that uh, whoever I bring up on stage is uh, not a troll, right? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. no, please, please, <laughs> yeah, please mm -hmm. don't troll us. We don't want to deal with that, right? But um, but if you're interested, uh, click that link. Um, we'll we'll give you a couple minutes to do so. And while we're waiting for people, let's talk about our um, let's talk about our website, dude. <laughs> So if you go to uh, Archangels. Also like if you are hanging out and you've enjoyed the content today. We appreciate oh, it. Oh, yeah. Please do. And share it on your wall. This this link will be useful. You know, uh, if you share it, I just, I think it would be great. Share it, please. You know. Um, all right. Archangels. Uh, media. Yeah. Okay. Justin and I haven't even been streaming for a year now. So we appreciate any support. Yes, of course. So uh, we have a few shirts and whatnot um, and some things that you might appreciate. Um, so we, if you are an ortho bro, right, uh, you know, you can, you can flex it, right? Uh, this is a very popular shirt right now. Uh, it comes in red. Unfortunately, it does not come in green. It couldn't get green, but um, different colors as well. Um, so if you've seen my uh, posts, you'll know that that is a thing. Um, and then apart from that, we also have here the pillar. Okay. Um, scripture says that the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of the truth. So this is a simple one front and back. Okay. Uh, DW says Kevin's shirt. Yes. Right. <laughs> the ortho, the ortho bro shirt. Right. So this is the church of the living God. Right. Um, and then we have this one here is the blood of the martyrs. This one is a, a bit darker, okay, um, but also glorious. So this is an image of Isis um, uh, bringing Christians, right, to the place where they will ultimately receive their crown, okay, um, of glory. And the back here says the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, okay. So it's good. So we have somebody in the back. Um, let's do this. So anyways, yeah, so that's Archangels, um, Archangels, media.org. Uh, media There's the link. Okay. 
and please check it out you know we do this for free so you know any any little support is wonderful and you will get a conversation piece and we have other stuff too as well i like this tumblr and whatnot so let's check this out so we got stop the screen hello jeff hey How are can you, you hear me yes i can how are you brother okay. i'm doing great uh, i'm really enjoying this stream this is awesome i mean I feel like i've learned a lot but cool um, I was going to ask about uh, the Ancient of Days specifically. Um, so is the Ancient of Days just kind of like a, it's purely a representation of the Father? Or is it, because I've heard mixed things from different people, that it's also like uh, the Son of Man represents Jesus assuming the full glory of the Ancient of Days. So I I don't know if that how we look at that or what the Orthodox view is on that, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I would say is, um, there's a couple things, right? If you look at revelation chapter one, um, you have Christ who, here, let me, let me see if I can pull this up actually real quick. Um, we weren't exactly going to get into this state, but I, because you asked the question, I think it's worthy of, of, uh, of, of talk and we'll probably, Andre will eventually probably, uh, see, you know, Get into this, probably. yeah. Get into this yeah. eventually, right? Um, let me see. I'll just, I'll just give you the entire screen. One sec. I'm having this. Uh, sometimes I get the. It, it gets defiant on me. So, um, here we go. So, <clears throat> Revelation chapter one. So remember, there are two. Um, what do you call it? Two uh, theophanic motifs, right? Or uh, what do you the the, the verbal right? The booming voice from heaven. Uh, and then there is the visual motif, right? right? And over time, what happens in this apocalyptic tradition is that things that belonged to the first motif, right? Uh, the first power motif, like the crown and the thorn and not the thorn, the, the throne and the clouds and all this stuff, uh, the white hair, right? Over time, they move from the first power to the second power. Does that make sense? Yeah. And God becomes this, you know, the father becomes this booming voice who's aniconic. You can't see. And um, the the son or not the son, but, you know, the second power becomes um, this visual experience. Right. Yeah. But what I find in Revelation chapter one, uh, we'll, we'll go over it here. Right. So, again, this is a vision. Right. So this is this is fitting in right with the apocalyptic literature that we've read already and like Enoch and and whatnot uh, in the exegoge of um, Ezekiel, the tragedian. OK. Um, says here, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him, which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the king of the earth and unto him that loves us and washes us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh. Hold on. Am I in the right spot? Yeah. Okay. Uh, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Right. And they also uh, which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. So you're seeing this seeing language. Right, which is second power stuff. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, said the Lord, which is and which was to come, which is, uh, which is and which was and which was to come, the Almighty. So I, Jesus identifying himself as the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, which is Sunday, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So now we have this oracular booming voice, okay? This boom, right? As of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest write in a book and send it unto the... Uh, seven churches, which are in Asia, and Ephesus, and Smyrna, and to Pergamos, and to Theotira, right? And so what happens is he hears his booming voice, and then he turns to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. We have that seven. This is a menorah, right? We actually still have the seven golden candlesticks within the Orthodox tradition. This is why people say that this happened during the divine liturgy. This vision that John has happens oh. during during the worship. Wow. Okay. okay. All right. 
And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Check this out. Remember we were talking about the ancient of the days having white hair, right? Yeah. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like a defiant brass, and as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So what we see in Christ is a bringing together of both of these motifs, right? So um, we have the Ancient of Days motif, the white hair and all this stuff, and the booming voice, and they're both coming um, from Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. It's connecting so, exactly with what you were talking about earlier. I mean, yeah, wow. So right, the title yeah. of the book, The Glory of the Invisible God, is visible in Christ. Right. He yeah, is wow. the visible Yahweh. Right. Right. And we're Absolutely. like the image of the image, I guess you could say, kind of, you know. We are created in that image. In yeah. that image that he is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so to answer your question, you know, there, uh, I, I had a slide earlier that, that depicted the father and the son and the Holy ghost. And in, in the majority of, um, Orthodox iconography, you don't see that kind of language because we understand that Jesus is the image of God, right? Occasionally you'll see a depiction of the Trinity in that way, but the vast majority of the time it's just Jesus, right? And we have canons against uh, making icons of the father because it's redundant. Just make an image of Jesus. Jesus is the image of the father. Now, Jesus is not the father. Me, you've himself. seen the father. Right. When you've that seen way. me, you've seen the father, right? That's what's, you know, being said, right? That's, that's, that's what's, what's being done. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was for a while, I've been kind of confused about how icons of the father really work. I mean, mm -hmm. and yeah, I've heard a lot of mixed things on it. So I think that really just reading this and uh, hearing you guys talk about it actually resolved that Jesus too. is the icon of the father. Yeah, right. he is. So. And what what is what I think is also important to keep in mind is that there are depictions of the ancient of days, who is the sun, okay? Mm -hmm. And how do you know he's the sun? Well, because whenever the sun is depicted, he's depicted with a cross in his halo, yeah. okay? And so if you see a depiction of the ancient of days, and it's got a cross in the halo with oon, right? Um the, the Greek letters uh, Omicron Omega Nu around the halo, what is being what is saying is that no, this is not an image of the Father. This is an image of, of Christ as the Ancient of Days. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right. That's yeah, basically my question. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> Jeff, thanks for coming, man. Appreciate no you. No Yeah, I've enjoyed watching this. This is awesome. Good. Yeah, this is great, man. Yeah. We, we we enjoy too. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All Wonderful. Right. Well, see you guys. Thanks. Godspeed, brother. Bye bye. All right. Uh, is anybody else uh, interested in uh, hopping on? Oh, I think actually at this point, I think it's probably worth uh, advertising our Discord, right? So we have a Discord server um, and we have a growing community of wonderful, like minded people who want to say, uh, you know, who want to study and want to learn. Um, and you know, we're, we love to come alongside people. If you're a catechumen, if you're interested in orthodoxy or anything like that, or even if you just want to learn uh, what we're reading, right, uh, you can always join our Discord uh, community, which also comes with fire memes, uh, many of them made by uh, this gentleman here, Retro Orthodox. Um, Retro Orthodox says it's technically only Russia in the last couple hundred years they've instituted canons against those depictions yes he's right um but russia making up the majority of orthodox christians you know um it, it, it becomes almost universal that we're not really supposed to depict the father actually I, I do believe um depictions of the father were condemned at the second um council of nicaea along with depictions of christ as the lamb right so if you see you know, a, lot, a lot of lutheran churches will have uh, Christ depicted as a lamb carrying a flag, right? It'd be like a, you know, uh, and we're not, we're not supposed to make those kinds of depictions. That's been uh, the case because Jesus isn't actually a lamb, right? Um, uh, he says, not to say the depictions are common outside that, but the existing canons are quite limited. Yeah, exactly. 
Okay. Well, I mean, if nobody else wants to uh, join um, the call, I think it's time for us to, to head out. Um, at, God bless you guys. Godspeed. Uh, consider yep. joining this Discord. And we're going to read for next week. Oh, thank you. Similar length of material here. Okay. I want to get through this next section. So if you are looking at the table of contents, just to go over that real quick, we pop, pop it up here. We're on page 32 right now, second mm -hmm. Enoch. And what I want to accomplish here is getting through second Enoch, Apocalypse of Abraham, Ladder of Jacob, and the Angelic Opposition. So up through page 61 is what we'll end. So about 30 um, pages again, and that will get us a good chunk through um, part one. And then um, that following week, we can kind of go through the conclusion and start into part two. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Let me, let me catch up there. Give me a second. Can everybody see this, by the way? <clears throat> So we're starting what page 32? Is that where we're starting? Yeah, at? page 32 at second Enoch. I mean, I'll just go to the mm -hmm. table of contents, brother. Oh, yeah, yeah good point. Thank yeah. you. Um, so second Enoch, Apocalypse of Abraham, Ladder of Jacob, Angelic Opposition. We'll stop there. I think mm -hmm. if we, we can't really chew on any more, this there's a lot of meat here already. But I think mm -hmm. this will uh this what we're gonna be going over next week. Yep. So um so a little less than us. 30 pages. Yeah, yeah. Pray <laughs> for us because this was uh man, this was this was exhilarating, but exhausting. And, <laughs> you know, because what we want to do for you all is chew it down and make it accessible because it's. Um, it's rough. I mean, it's 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 scholarly work. You know, this yeah. is not. Um, it's not this easy reading this. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not easy reading. So uh, not cool. saying that you guys aren't super intelligent. If you guys are. Um, yeah, so we are going to be going to the voice chat after, um, when we get off here, um, and, uh, you guys will be able to, uh, hang out with us in the discord and we can talk about it, uh, live, uh, a couple of things here. Uh, Michael says Christ the lamb is the main icon for the Moravian, uh, the proto Protestants. Yes, that's yes, that is true. Um, so the Moravians broke off before Luther and before even the Anglicans and all that. Right. So and, and Jeff says uh, at some point I need to read um, these other pieces of literature. He says this made clear to me. At some point I need to read some of these other books. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say yes. Um, at some point you'd want to get to those. Um, my only suggestion is get a very strong um, understanding of the Orthodox canon before venturing into. Um, apocalyptic and non-canonical type literature because that way you can kind of stay within um there's a reason why some of this stuff isn't canon okay right, the, right. You, you can't go around thinking that enoch is the son of man yeah and be orthodox right so. um so yeah but this is um really beautiful literature and i would i would say start with that and then understand the history of the Second Temple period. What's going on? Who's fighting who? Which emperor took over and which ones got exiled? And really get a good understanding of what's going on in that time period. And then it's going to help you connect dots. And there's some good literature we can point you to as well as far as mm -hmm. understanding Second Temple period. And then it'll help you have a more fruitful interaction with um these other pieces of literature i think okay mm -hmm. that's very my, good that's my advice um david says are you going to, uh to the after club voice chat yes meet us at the after party right we have champagne and no, entertainment wait, oh we have we have lentils uh, we've got lentils and beans <laughs> 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 Yeah. Um, so very good. Uh, Michael said he's in the car with his family. Won't be able to join us, unfortunately. Um, no Napoleon, dude. I, I think gotta Michael say, Michael should just pull over. Yeah, Michael needs to just pull over. Yeah. 
I, I sorry, I, fam. You know, I gotta uh, talk right now. <laughs> uh, so no, no Napoleon uh, Bony shorts. He's the one who inspired our video. Um, do you have the right Bible? Right. And uh, he, he, he leaves great comments, wild comments. And we're very uh, thankful for his um, contributions to our community. He's always good for a good laugh. And, and, and he's got some good thoughts too. So, uh, God bless you, man. I really hope we didn't offend you by making that video. We we did it as a tribute. We really like your comments. They're, they're a lot of fun. So, um, cool. Anything else? I think we're good. All right. Godspeed. See you guys in the voice chat. Bye. Yeah.